Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm super happy to be here and would want to thank the organizers and Fabrice in particular for the invitation to uh, do the first talk here at this conference. I'm very excited to see that real non-virtual conferences are back. This is actually the first one I'm, 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 I'm speaking at. And I'm also very excited that there are so many of you here. So uh, it's, it's really wonderful that we can start with uh, so much uh, people and energy uh, into the real conference season. So uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, the talk is called Simply Scala. So well, it's, a, it's about Scala, obviously. And uh, it's about the quest for simplicity. Because I think that Scala is actually a real clean and simple, languages, a simple language. And probably a lot of you think so as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, in fact, uh, I think we have further simplified the language by the transition of Scala 2 to Scala 3. Most languages get larger and more complicated over time. They acquire feature over feature. And in Scala 2 to 3, in this transition, we did something quite radical. That we said, no, we're going to be backwards incompatible in major ways. So there, there are major things that will fall away. Uh, there will be replacements. There is a migration path. There are rewrite rules. Uh, and, and there's binary compatibility, which is very important. So Scala 3 programs can still consume Scala 2 libraries. And for all these reasons, the transition has been actually quite smooth. So it wasn't really a, a, a huge break from, let's say, Python 2 to Python 3. Not at all. Uh, and at the same time, we managed to make the language quite a lot uh, cleaner, <coughs> simpler, more pleasant to programming. Uh, so uh, overall, I would state that Scala is actually, for an industrial strength language, it's quite small. There are some academic languages like, let's say, Scheme or Racket or Python. Uh, well, no, Python is actually no longer small, but uh, uh, what is it, Pirate? Uh, uh, languages like that that are really uh, very minimal, uh, and they are minimal for teaching, so that it's easy to teach the whole of the language to two students, but generally these languages haven't found large industrial adoption because they're lacking certain essential features. So for an industrial language, it's actually quite small. Its features compose well. Uh, it's very easy to read, even more easy to read with Scala 3, I would claim. And it's becoming more opinionated. That was one of the criticisms levied against Scala before that. Essentially, there are too many ways to do things. Uh, which is uh, still true. It's not true because there are so many features and you have this endless, essentially, language feature uh, collection to choose from, but because the features that Scala has compose really well. So you can essentially mix every idiom with every other one, and that overall gives you a fairly large choice of, uh, of solutions. Um, some data that I've presented before, uh, the uh, number of... What I measured here uh, is the number of lines that the context-free grammar of a language needs. So basically, the syntax of the language. Uh, so you can't really read it very well. Here's Scala. So that's uh, the size of the grammar in Scala. Uh, Haskell is a bit smaller. Uh, but I should say that's core Haskell. And Haskell has, I don't know, uh, it, uh, probably more by now of uh, 85 language extensions, which people actually use quite liberally. So that would definitely add to that bar here. That's Python uh, uh, a while ago, 3.1 or something like that. So I think it's also grown a little bit. Uh, and Python, of course, these languages have it easier because they don't need types. So essentially, one half of the language is missing. Uh, uh, the, uh, because uh, because you don't so you don't need syntax for that. Um, then there's uh, here here you have Kotlin quite a bit larger already. Swift, Java 8. Uh, so that uh, was uh, essentially uh, at the time also some years ago. I mean Java 17 or 19 would grow more. Java has acquired quite a lot of features recently. Here we have C++ and here we have C sharp. Um, so Scala by and large is not a very large language. Um, why then is it seen as a very complex language? So one, one, re one, one th idea why that could be is also, if you look at those two languages, if I ask you which is more complex, C++ or C Sharp? Let's not talk about Scala, let's talk about other languages. Which is more complex? <laughs> 
everybody would say C++, of course, uh, C++ is more complex. And I would agree. Uh, but in terms of feature size, actually C Sharp is larger. So which means that it seems that you can have a lot of different features and not get the reputation of a very complex language because if each of these features are very easy to use and essentially if they are, uh, have do one specific narrow thing well. So for instance, C Sharp has a thing called delegates, which, is, which are still in C Sharp, uses quite a lot of syntax. Nobody uses them anymore, so people can safely ignore that. They don't really interact with anything else. They're just essentially an end user feature for GUI, GUI development or something like that. So let's forget about it, but it's still in the language. So the language gets very large. Whereas C++ is this thing that it's very large first, and then also a lot of features interact in complicated ways. So, for Scala, we have a similar perception. The language is small, but it's seen to be very complex. It has that reputation, definitely. If you look at the uh, Hacker News or something like that, uh, what you read is Scala, isn't that a super complicated language? It's compared to C++ in complexity, and a lot of people say Rust would be simpler than Scala, which is completely ridiculous. Um, so the other complaint one often hears is that Scala programmers are hard to find. They are these super experts that are so difficult to, uh, essentially to get. And that's another thing that I find surprising because we have actually graduated tens of thousands of people in our online courses and they're very good other resources as well like the Rock, the JVM and things like that. So they're very successful online courses and people have taken them but then essentially it seems that Maybe the job market is so big that these are all, all already in jobs, uh, or they don't count as Scala programmers, or I don't know what. On the other hand, if you look at the teaching side, at the academic side, then Scala is actually quite popular and successful for an intro in uh, programming universities. Uh, there are good arguments made why Scala is actually superior to Python as a first course, uh, because uh, essentially types are very useful when you use them in, uh, in a REPL, which is if the course is uh, REPL based, then types is something that the, the computer shows you in the result of things. So it's something that is it's very useful feedback from the compiler. It's not something that you have to too much keep in your head and, and, and wrestle with. It's also uh, uh, compared uh, measurably uh, very well against Java. There's a course at Lund University given by Björn Regnell, who uh, taught a two-year course, in, or the, the university program taught a two-year course first, uh, and essentially at the end of the two-year course uh, there's an exam about the measured Java knowledge and he changed the first year to Scala and only in the second year uh, people learn Java and the result was that after two years the Java knowledge of the programming knowledge in Java of people was measurably better when they started with Scala than when they had two years of, of, of Java. So there are really... Uh, uh, shown, uh, demonstrated, de demonstrated successes in teaching Scala at universities. And it doesn't stop there. It can essentially go further to, to schools. Uh, remember Kojo? There was a very successful project to teach Scala to disadvantaged kids in, in, in India. And uh, there's also uh, Shadai Ladad, whom you see here the first time he gave a talk at a Scala conference. Uh, I think that was 12, 11 years ago, was it 12 years ago, or something like that. So now he's a very successful um, PhD student at Berkeley, uh, no longer, uh, but he learned Scala when he was 11 and found, found, it, found it fun and, and, and very simple. So on the one hand, we have these successes, and I think Scala is a very use a very fun and, and productive language for kids, for learners, for everything. And on the other hand, it's has this uh, reputation to be so complicated. So what happened? So I think there are several factors that happened that uh, essentially led to that. One definitely is uh, code bases grew. Uh, Scala has been used in industry for 10 years now, something like that. Uh, and uh, over the time, of course, as for, ev for every code base, these, these things become uh, larger, more gnarly, and things like that. So a lot of this, this, these, these things are now legacy code or code, code bases that essentially newcomers have to wrestle with, which is never, never fun and uh, 
Uh, that's definitely a disadvantage that essentially Scala came from a young green language in which you did greenfield projects and you could do everything yourself and design everything to something which essentially now has million line code bases and you have to deal with them somehow. Uh, the other thing that I think happened and uh, well, that wasn't necessarily uh, beneficial for Scala was that traditional functional programming discovered Scala and mostly left it since, I should say, but the, the effect lingers on. So for a long time, basically, uh, Scala was the language a Haskell programmer and enthusiast actually could get a job in because there were no Haskell jobs. And I, I don't think there still there aren't there aren't many many now. So there were a lot of people who were sort of yeah exiles. You say, you say. they they would love nothing better to, to write code in Haskell, but now all they have is Scala. So what do you do? You you essentially massage your code base so that it looks like the language you, you, you like and you admire, and that happened a lot. A lot of Haskell idioms were, were imported, and that was possible, and because Scala is such a flexible language. So it, it lends itself to, because it's essentially, and why is it flexible? Because it's very abstraction oriented. So you can essentially write abstractions that compose well, and that means you can also do things like uh, essentially uh, very traditional functional techniques, which of course have a value, but there's a price to pay. So the the I'm, I'm not at all arguing against functional programming. I use functional programming with abandon in my own code, and I think it's, it's really a good idiom. But the problem is that you get into ideological battles if you overdo it. Ideological battles like you should never use a var, even though I'll, I'll argue later that actually some uses of mutable variables are actually very good. They make your code more readable. You should never use exceptions. You should never use object uh, composition and so on. So basically forget about one half of the Scala language and make everything do with the other. Um, the other reason was that many large code bases overtype and over abstract, and we'll get to that. Uh, and the, the third part is they also overuse domain specific languages to create new syntax, uh, fragmenting the user uh, experience. That was probably one design mistake. Well, you couldn't say mistake, but a design that we came to regret, at least in part, that Scala at the beginning was also syntactically extremely fluent, flexible. You could uh, write method names in fix, and that let you essentially create DSLs that almost looked like the real thing. Uh, so I'm thinking, for instance, at, at let's say, Scala test, uh, uh, certain Scala test things that where you, it looks, almost looks like English when you write this thing, because Scala is, is a very flexible language. And I think <clears throat> that that is a thing that we have come to regret, because uh, by being able to do that, uh, we, uh, we miss a common standard, that every code has essentially the same style, and, 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 and you, you, you can easily understand at least the basics of the code you read. If sort of the, even the syntactical conventions are completely different, that's an unnecessary hurdle. So that, that's definitely something that also uh, caused uh, difficulty for newcomers uh, in the code basis. And I believe the other thing that uh, has happened is that the entry-level tooling became too complicated. And I'm looking uh, at, at, at SPT, uh, because that's something that actually has been done by, by TypeSafe, Lightband, and, and will, be, will essentially be further maintained uh, by community and Scala Center. So SPT definitely has been a problem. Uh, it has, at, uh, it, it, I think it's got, gotten better over time, but there was this culture shock uh, in SPT 013, 0011, 013, something like that, when uh, the, uh, the SPT is just a very difficult uh, way to write build scripts. And I think that has done the Scala reputation no good at all, that SPT is sort of the, the entry uh, to, to, to Scala when you write even a simple Scala project, which is not a script. Then the next step is to use SPT, and SPT is definitely not simple. I stated here, SPT is absolutely not my idea how you should interact with Scala. And unfortunately, that's what we got. So we'll, 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 we'll get over that, and I'll, I'll talk about that as well. So um, you could say, well, OK, large code bases and suboptimal tooling, that's sort of something that every language is struck. Uh, so, uh, but I think code bases written in Scala also created some specific barriers to entry for newcomers. 
Uh, one is that uh, we, the Scala APIs often tend to be very complex. Uh, and why are they complex? Because uh, uh, essentially they adva expose advanced language features such as higher kind of types and implicits in the user API. Um, uh, they expose complex design patterns such as free monads, tagless final, monad transformers, iterates, and so on. And I'm not, I'm saying that essentially community at large is uh, somewhat uh, uh, in, in uh, there, there's a strong tendency to go into that corner, no matter what software you look at. And also sometimes you find very, very large type class hierarchies. Uh, I mean, Scala collections have been criticized for being too large, and uh, the 213 collections ha have shrunk the hierarchy quite a bit. But if I compare that to, let's say, cats, then, well, cats blows it out of the water. Uh, so all that leads to very complex applications. And the question is, well, why? Why the complexity? What are the reasons for the complexity? Um, I think that the... Uh, the justification, well, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be very <laughs> uh, frank here. I think complexity is a, is a thing we have to battle with because we are all engineers and engineers tend to over-engineer. They like to do that. It's fun. It's fun to do that. It's fun to essentially have a solution that is really solves a problem at 110%, something like that. If you have free time and people let you, then uh, we, we like to do that. And, and then we have to sort of uh, weigh that against the cost. In traditional engineering, there would be a manager and says, well, you, you built this, uh, this, this, this nice, uh, I don't know, motor for the car uh, or a central heating or something like that, but it's too expensive. It's over-engineered, it's too expensive. You need to find a simpler solution that, uh, that, that, uh, that costs less money. But in computing, it's not, nothing is too expensive. Uh, computers are, are fast enough, right? So we can throw a, as many... Uh, 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 clever features at, 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 at software as we want to. And uh, that's also essentially okay as long as you keep it to yourself. That means as long as it's your implementation that you essentially over-engineer and as long as it, as it doesn't leak into APIs. But uh, the justification for complexity uh, Still, uh, so, so the question is, well, what, what is sort of the benefits of having com complex things in the APIs? And there are two very common and often true justifications. And one of the justifications is strong typing, and the other is pure functional programming. So about strong, or I should rather say elaborate typing, there's the common belief that if it can guarantee absence of some class of runtime errors, any amount of compile time complexity is justified. I've actually heard that literally from, from a, a well-known member of the Scala community. So, uh, is that true? If, if it can guarantee absence of some class of runtime errors, you can essentially, basically, overhead in typing is always better than catching errors at runtime. I don't think that's true because we completely overlook testing in here. Testing is a very good alternative in many cases. I mean, we're all happy about having types, having to write fewer tests because we have strong type systems, but it's not an, uh, an either or. It's, it's always a trade-off. So there could be sort of a, uh, or there definitely always is a, a, a delta, an, an epsilon of things which you could pop potentially get with the types if you complicate your types uh, quite a bit more, but that in the end will be easier handled with a test. So here's an example from our own code base. Um, the uh, Dotty compiler, Dotty is a Scala compiler for Scala 3. Uh, so a compiler builds a syntax tree called an AST, abstract syntax tree, and then it transforms it in many different phases. Dotty has close to 100 phases which are bunched for efficiency and something like that. Each phase does very little. Um, and uh, what the phases typically do is they simplify the tree. So over time, the tree will have fewer and fewer kinds, classes of nodes, until in the end, the tree has essentially only classes of nodes that are representable in a Java virtual machine, and then you can convert to bytecode. That's how it works. So one thing that compiler writers often would want to have is to say, well, can we type that statically, that at each phase, 
the kind of node classes uh, is essentially captured in a type. So if I, if I persist a node that uh, only exists at type error and shouldn't exist in some middle phase, then that would be a type error. And um, people have tried for a long time, mostly in Haskell, and have come up with very complicated solutions. So the whole thing blows, blows out of the water. You need an AST per phase, or uh, there are also design patterns to make it a little bit better. It's an open problem how to do that. So what we did in Dotty is, is none of that. We said, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same AST all the way down, and what we have instead is essentially uh, assertions uh, that a face can say, I have eliminated this kind of node, so every face after me, if, if that node gets generated, the compiler will blow up. And since the, if we then run the compiler on, uh, I think right now it's more than 10 million lines of community, uh, that's sort of what we do in the, in the nightly tests, and there's a pretty high chance that these assertions will have caught everything, because essentially, if a compiler generates a node in some circumstances, then if it, if it wouldn't do that for all the existing tests and all the existing codes and projects, then that's almost inconceivable. So here, I think we definitely were better with a test than even though we could have gone with a type. There, there, there are known type patterns. Okay, so what about pure functional programming? Uh, common belief is that mutability is always bad and should be avoided. If you're a functional programmer, then uh, you shouldn't do any of the, of the mutable things. If you do, then you say you're just essentially, you write better Java. Uh, that's sort of the, the, the uh, uh, term that, that people use for that. Um, and I think that's also wrong. Uh, it, it really depends on the situation. And if you're a mature outlook for software engineering, then uh, you, part of that is really to, to think about the trade-offs and to choose the best solution in each kind and to be not ideological. So local variables often help readability uh, rather than destroy it. And global variables are admittedly a, a lot more problematic, especially when alias. So uh, when we say don't use var, then maybe one could say don't use global vars, and especially when, you're, when, you, when, when these things get, can be accessed by multiple different <coughs> paths. But uh, for local vars, that's absolutely not the, not the same problem. So here's a funny example, again from the compiler. Uh, so uh, the compiler has for the error messages an algorithm for nearest neighbors uh, of strings uh, called the so-called the, the Levenstein distance. Uh, so it's used in Scala error messages. So for instance, if you write xs.fatmap x uh, to uh, something, then the compiler would say, well, uh, that, that value is not a member of list of int. Did you mean xs.flatmap? So what it did is essentially it looked at the members of the list class with the smallest distance uh, of insertions or deletions uh, to, uh, or replacements to uh, the, the name FATMAP that was given. Okay, so uh, there's an algorithm for that. You can describe it in the books, uh, but most of the descriptions you find are imperative. So uh, there was one... Uh, uh, so, so yes, yeah, the, the one that we have here is actually quite uh, understandable, I think. So essentially what you do is you have a, a matrix and you essentially have essentially a distance uh, uh, array here and then you fill the matrix from the top left uh, corner to the bottom right corner. Uh, so here you have the initialization uh, where um, you uh, say... Uh, uh, so that's the corner case. If one of them is zero, then that's the distance. And otherwise, each distance gets computed from the three cells, uh, the diagonal here and here. And you, you essentially, you go down. Uh, so that's, that's all fine and uh, actually not very remarkable and quite readable. But of course, uh, it uses a var, or rather an array, uh, a mutable array, which is a bunch of vars. Uh, so um, the question is, can we do that functionally? And that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, you can do it functionally in a horribly inefficient way. The question is, can you do it functionally in an efficient way? And the answer is, is there, there is yes, you can do that as well, but it gets very complicated, a lot more complicated than that. So what we had before, so, so what actually happened is I basically copy-pasted copy this thing from the web 
after I found out that our Levenstein distance actually didn't work before. It just was wrong. Uh, it, it gave you the wrong things, uh, the wrong suggestions. Sometimes it gave you the right ones, but sometimes it made no sense. And, and then I looked at it and said, well, what, what have you written here? And what I found was this. Uh, I, I don't understand what this is. I looked at it, I scratched my head, and, but it's obviously wrong. It did the wrong thing. It was the wrong algorithm. And then I found out that, that there was, for a while, there was this thing in Haskell that was on the web, Leven, uh, a simple, a Levenstein uh, distance in Haskell, and basically this was also copy-pasted from the web, but it was unfortunately the wrong algorithm. Uh, so that shows, but this one is purely functional, right? So this is good, right? Unfortunately, well, if it's the wrong algorithm, that, that, that helps you nothing. And I would say that even if it was the right algorithm, then uh, sorry, but uh, I, I just find this a lot clearer than this. Uh, another example is uh, graph traversal. And again, I'm, I'm only telling you stories that I've actually seen. I'm not making anything up here. So uh, graph traversal, um, let's say we have a, uh, a graph um, uh, as represented as a class node. And each node has a, a list of nodes, which are its children, so its, its, its uh, successors in the graph. Uh, and then you want to count how many nodes are in the graph. The graph could have, could, could have cycles. And uh, so what you do is you set up a set uh, of nodes that you have seen, and then you have this little recur function, which says, well, if you've seen a node, then, uh, it, uh, then you don't add to the count, and otherwise uh, you add the node to seen, and you uh, recur over the children uh, with the sum node, and you uh, add one for the, to, uh, to account for the node. So that's all. Super simple. But again, it's not functional. It uses uh, a mutable set in this thing here. And some people say, well, you should never use a mutable collection. Well, I give, you, give that as a challenge to you. Try to do it with an immutable collection, and then compare the two. With an immutable collection, what you would have to do is you would have to, as you go through it, you would have to keep essentially both the, the nodes seen so far and the count and essentially thread this all, whole thing through, through all the nodes. It would be uh, a lot more complicated, would be a lot less efficient as well. And all basically for ideology to say, well, yeah, no, it's, uh, we, we, it's not pure functional programming, so it's bad. Uh, so the third thing that um, I believe happens also and which is detrimental is essentially to, to push things too much into sort of DSLs in, in libraries. So a question I've uh, gotten at uh, Scala Matsuri, I think it was uh, 2016 probably, was about um, uh, 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 what I should use for option. So, we have this uh, idiom, this pattern here, that we say we have uh, an optional value, maybe x, and, and we say, well, uh, if it uh, exists, then do, uh, return an operation on the x, and otherwise return a default value. And the question I got was, should I, we, we are, we're not sure, so I they asked me as sort of the arbiter, we're not sure, should we use map and get or else, or should we use fold for that? So map or get or else would look like this, so. You do have a map, and the other one was uh, this one here. So what do you think? What should one use? Well, my answer was, well, what's wrong with the first version? So the first version is perfectly good. It's by, by far the clearest, right? So it's completely clear what this is. And people say, yeah, but it's three lines. Well, three lines is good. Uh, three short lines is much better than, than a long line like this. And again, that's, that's, uh, it's only yesterday that I saw a, 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 an occurrence of fold in a compiler code base, and I could make neither heads nor tails of it and said, what fold is that? Where does the fold come from? And I said, oh, it's option.fold. So somebody uh, <laughs> had written an option.fold in here, and it did absolutely nothing for legibility. It was completely detrimental. So the problem here is, I think, that what's in a sense good and very powerful is that Scala makes is a very good language to make library code look like language, but sometimes that makes ab unnecessary abstraction too tempting. Okay, so this was, was my large critique to say, well, here are sort of all the traps and pitfalls that we can fall into and that we have to guard against. So how can we avoid uh, complexity? What are some of the tips that we could 
do to essentially make a better job at keeping things simple. So I think the first, the first thing is uh, use Scala 3. That's uh, definitely a great start. Um, another thing that uh, uh, I want to advertise here is uh, a nice little option for the compiler called vProfile. So what vProfile does is essentially you can run it uh, like this. Uh, you either write vProfile or vProfile details, and uh, that gives you essentially the compiled files and some metrics for the compiled files. In particular, there's a complexity matrix. So how do we compute that complexity matrix? So that's basically the size of the generated tasty divided by the, uh, I think, number of tokens or number of lines. I'm not sure. I think it was number of tokens. Uh, so number of lexemes in the source. Um, uh, so essentially, that says, well, if your, if your source uh, is produces a very large tasty file compared to uh, the, the, the source file, then there's hidden complexity in the source. And where does this hidden complexity usually come from? Uh, a large part is implicits. So if you do a lot of very expensive implicit derivations so that essentially complex implicit terms get generated, that of course causes a lot of code. Uh, another large part could be uh, macros. Uh, Macros can generate an arbitrary amount of code and so on. And generally, Tasty, because Tasty is a, a, a format that's uh, very, uh, essentially, there's a lot of compression in the format. So, Tasty is a pretty good measurement of how much information really is in. In, in your in your in in your code base. So basically, uh, the, if if you have a lot of a large tasty size compared to uh, small source lines, that means that there's a lot of hidden information about your source that is embodied in the tasty. Uh, so this profile details then also shows you essentially if you want to drill down the most complex methods that you have. So that's actually the absolute size of the tasty. And that, that also can essentially guide you in particular if you, if you say, well, uh, my code base requires uh, a long time to compile it super slow. And that's typically linked to this sort of hidden complexity. Because actually, the Scala compiler is, I, I believe, it's reasonably fast when it's, when it's uh, warm. It's in, in the thousands, between two and five thousands of lines a second, say, something like that, it does for normal code. But if the code is very complex, that means that a lot of code is generated by implicit or macros, of course, that's added hidden work for the compiler. So basically, if you generate something with an implicit or macro, that costs just as much as if you had written this thing from source originally. And that's typically, if you have very slow compile times, where it comes from. So that's a good tool to, to pinpoint it. Um, the other one is uh, with the tooling. I think we have seen a lot of progress there. In particular, I think uh, Scala CLI uh, is, is, is really a breath of fresh air that you, we, we can say we can, can run simple projects without any fuss whatsoever. Uh, and uh, the uh, fourth thing is, I think, one uh, we, we have to try hard to prefer simple APIs, which means as if, if you have the occasion to write a new li library, then prefer simplicity in, P in the API. If you're a consumer that uses libraries, prefer simple libraries if you can. But where do you find simple libraries? That's, uh, that's, that's another problem here. So how do you know what is simple, what, what works well together? So currently, it's a pro that's a problem, and that's why we have started an initiative called Scala Toolkit, uh, which is uh, the idea is that we want to have a core set of libraries that are very accessible and approachable and that are intentionally not very advanced. In particular, they wouldn't typically solve the uh, reactive programming or async problem. Uh, that's, that, that we leave essentially to more elaborate things. But if you just want to write a simple script or learn something and send a request to a web server, get a response, <laughs> things like that, you need nothing, none of that. And what you want is a very simple library. So what we do is we cooperate with maintainers of a small set of libraries uh, that are already battle tested by the community to essentially compose a set uh, and the focus should be on suitability for scripting, prototyping, and newcomer friendliness. So that should take nothing away from essentially more elaborate things, platform uh, frameworks, and, 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 and essentially more clever asynchronous libraries and things like that. Uh, and what we want to do is to make these libraries easily accessible and documented in one place. 
and that's essentially what Scala Toolkit. So what you can do here, uh, for instance, so that it's not yet there, but that's the vision, is that in, in Scala CLI, you would just say using toolkit as, a, as one of these using commands, and then essentially you could uh, uh, just implement uh, an HTTP client and uh, get, get going without, without any, any sort of uh, setup. Uh, and uh, in, uh, alongside HTTP clients, we want to essentially have more initial, initially, I think it's JSON testing, uh, but uh, hopefully there's more to come, and it's an invitation to the community to actually participate in that and essentially propose things, and sometimes I probably need some work to work well together and do that. As I said, focus always simplicity, newcomer friendliness, no advanced features. It's just, just essentially the basics that you need to get started. Uh, a lot of this, I, I should say, is, is inspired from Python, which has sort of a similar focus to say, let's, let's just give you some tools to work with, and we relegate the more advanced stuff to, to other things. So Scala is suited, as we know, both for prototyping and big applications, but I think for the prototyping, for the simple problems, that's what we, what we need better solutions for, and uh, hopefully Scala Toolkit will help. So the other thing that, um, uh, where we come to complexity uh, has to do with effect typing. So that, that has been a long part of it, uh, and it has been essentially the, I think the trend, the, the, the the, uh, how do you say, the, the constraints have been that a lot of Scala program, advanced Scala programs are in settings where you have to be reactive. Essentially, you have to have support millions of logical threads, uh, uh, and you have uh, very advanced uh, scheduling and control problems over these. And the, and the solution each time was to essentially develop a so-called effect system, which is essentially a monadic system typically, where uh, your code is essentially data. So they're closures that you can, that you can work with. Uh, and that has uh, complexities, but they were seen so far as mostly inevitable. Um, so um, monadic effect typing is, I think, uh, admittedly a large sort of complexities. Uh, because fine-grained effects need complicated design patterns. And it also tells you that something is, that the, there's a problem that these design patterns are sort of shift every two years as a new set that is proposed because the old set has been shown to be too complex. So uh, there have been free monads and there have been uh, monad transformers and there's finally taglets. And essentially every two years there's another one, but none of them is easy. Uh, none of them is really e e easy to understand for a newcomer. But what can you do about it? So if you need that, what can you do? Uh, so um, one big uh, way forward, I think, is that uh, at least from the run times, there, will, there is change now with uh, Project Loom on the JVM, for instance, that we will have essentially ways to run millions of threads that have nothing to do with monads or mon monadic, uh, because the JVM will do them for us. So at least on the JVM, they, I think that will cause quite a revolution in APIs and the way we actually write these applications. But there's still other things. I mean, effects are not just about suspending and uh, async. Uh, effects are lots of things, exceptions, uh, uh, result values, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, dealing with continuations and so on, uh, mutations, side effects, and things like that. So what are the alternatives? Well, one thing which is essentially core Scala without uh, these, these library extensions is to say, well, yeah, we don't check them. Uh, there are no checked exceptions. There are no tracking of side effects. You just write them responsibly. Uh, uh, but nobody will look over your shoulder and say, you, you can't do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, that's OK. But it sort of leaves a feeling to say, well, yes, but uh, we are we are proponents of strong typing, and we've made a lot of advantages there, advances there. So to just leave out these things led, I think, historically also in Scala to the thing that you say, well, if we can't control them with a type system, then you shouldn't use them. So I think a lot of the pushback against exceptions and, uh, and uh, variables and things like that is, al is, is always that, well, these are hidden side effects, and we can't 
essentially argue, reason about them formally. Uh, we can't put, have them in the type system. So if you don't want essentially monotransformers, then you could have coarser info, info like Zio, for instance, where you say, well, either you're in the Zio monad, then you're impure, uh, so, and one size of impure fits all, or you're pure, that means you, 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 you don't need, uh, need, need, uh, need Zio, you, ha you, you have a simple uh, function result that is not an instance of the Zio type. Or the third uh, solution would be to research better effect systems. So ideally what we want is we want to write use checked exceptions, uh, side effects and things like that in a very uh, responsible way that the compiler will control for us. Uh, only the question is how to do that, and that's essentially an open research question. The good news is that uh, we just got a lot of funding over five years to actually do this research. Uh, we, the, uh, the, the, uh, thing, the program has already started, the funding will start next year and will last for five years, and we want to essentially solve this problem of effect typing and effect checking, and while we're at it, we, we're going to solve the problem of resources as well. So um, I'm just switching to a Different presentation now. Okay, so which describes that project and what we're going to do in the project. So the project is called uh, Caprese. Uh, uh, that's uh, part of EPFL, that's a so called learning center. Um, the, uh, and Caprese is an acronym for uh, Capabilities for Resources and Effects. And in fact, that's two areas where uh, static typing has lagged behind. Uh, there are hundreds, probably thousands of papers about resources and effects, mostly effects. Uh, it's been all over, uh, all programming uh, conferences and things like that. Uh, but uh, there's no large-scale adoption yet of any of this, the, the, these research things, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see why that is, I think. So the core insights of what, we, what we're already doing is that we want to model resources and effects as capabilities. I'll explain what a capability is later. And we uh, can track retained capabilities in types. So let's talk about the, what these terms mean. So what is a resource? A resource is a value that's available only with certain restrictions. A restriction could be lifetime, so limited lifetime, or sharing can be used only exclusively by one thread or one computation, or quantity. Maybe you can have only one instance of a, of, of a thing. So examples are uh, a variable uh, is a resource, a region of memory, a file handle, a channel, or a database or network connections. These are all essentially values that you can use only with essentially some strings attached, some limitations. You can't use them freely like our, our functional values that we can, can use everywhere and uh, as long as we like. What is an effect? Uh, so for me, is an effect is an aspect of the computation beyond shapes of inputs and outputs that we want to track in the types. Uh, an example is updating variables, throwing exceptions, I.O., or uh, suspending a computation. So if we look at traditional what's called effect typing, then it's actually almost a misnomer uh, because effect typing is precisely pushing these effects into the types. Right now, now you suddenly have a type that talks about the effects. So in a, in a sense, it's you, you shift the thing from a traditional effect problem to, to a type problem. Uh, but effect systems are to essentially keep these things, in a sense, outside of the, of the core type system. Okay, so if we, in a sense, you could say that resources and effects in programming are precisely the difference between uh, the lofty model of lambda calculus and functional programming and the gnarly things that actual computers do. In a lambda calculus, there is no resource. Every value lives forever and can be used as often as we like. And there are no effects either, of course. Every function is pure. Whereas in computers, computers work exclusively by essentially performing effects using resources, right? That's all. Everything is, lim is, everything is finite in a computer. And in the end, what a computer can do is a mutation of some memory or your screen or uh, uh, some, some output channel on your network. So that 
distinction between uh, uh, purity uh, and uh, uh, and uh, resources and effects is uh, also uh, reflected in programming languages. So. On the one hand, you have very low-level languages like C, C++, which are imperative, where essentially everything you do, every statement you do, performs an effect and uh, uh, uses a resource, because since variables are uh, in, C, in C, C++ are stack allocated, they have limited lifetimes, so they might go away, so you can, can have these things with dangling pointers when things are deallocated and so on. So basically, everything you use has strings attached, the, the, the storage might not be available anymore. Of course, you can program around them, but conceptually, it's a resource. And on the other hand, you have very high-level languages, such as, for instance, Haskell, Scala, Lisp, or Camel on the more functional side. Uh, and then in the middle, you have languages like Go, Java, and Swift. Um, so there's another dimension here in this thing, uh, which is interesting to look up, and that is to what degree do these languages actually track the use of resources and effects? And uh, the answer so far for most languages is not very much. Uh, C++ zero, uh, Java a little bit, because they're checked exceptions, so that's at least one uh, system of a, of a one effect system that is checked. Uh, it's not very popular, which shows that there is a problem in, in actually checking these exceptions. But you could say, well, at least Java tried. Haskell has, so, as we know, effect monads and things like that. So that's another uh, attempt to actually get more into that direction. And then there's a language Rust, uh, which goes a lot farther, but uh, in a lot more limited way. Basically, Rust has very fine-grained tracking of memory effects, of effects on, on, on memory, uh, including tracking of sharing and, and, and lifetime. So Rust, uh, despite its sort of um, functional-inspired patterns, is uh, at heart, a imperative language. Uh, a lot of functional idioms are very hard to express in Rust because a lot of functional idioms require a garbage collector, and Rust doesn't have one by design. So Rust is definitely intended to be an imperative language. So the question is, well, up there in this triangle, what, what would it be a language that is sort of higher level, more functional oriented, but still has fine-grained tracking of resources and effects? And there have been many attempts over the years. Uh, so Linear Haskell uh, probably actually made it into the language, but the others have stayed uh, so far, uh, mostly research projects. Singularity was a big project at Microsoft to make a safe operating system. Mezzo was a project at INRIA here in Paris. Uh, alias types were, were very fashionable 15 years ago. Algebraic effects are fashionable now. But none of them are sort of very central in, in, in languages yet. And that's what we, we want to change with Caprese. Uh, so Caprese is intended to be something that you can actually use that is tracked effect and resources on a high level. OK, so let's talk about capabilities. So the, at, at the core, like I said, uh, the core of the idea is to model effects as capabilities. So let me explain what that means. So here we have two ways to express basically the same thing. The first thing is sort of Java inspired and it says, well, we have a function f and it returns a t and it might throw an exception e. So throwing an exception, that's an effect annotation. That's an effect. And the second version of f uh, says, well, here we have a f and it just returns a t, but to do so, it needs to have a parameter of type can throw e. So I can throw the exception. OK. So the first thing is an effect, and the second thing is what we call a capability. So capability is something that enables you to do something and that's typically passed as a parameter. And Scala has implicit parameters, which makes passing such capabilities very, very convenient. So you can essentially, you don't need to essentially do the, the, uh, the, the, the work of actually passing these things down. So um, you could say, OK, yeah, but aren't these equivalent? What's the benefit of going to capabilities? So here's a very, very important benefit. Capabilities support effect polymorphism. So here's the example that we always study, the, the map function that everybody's favorite, that everybody knows. So here's map on list of A, uh, just uh, maps uh, an A to B, yielding a list of B, right? So if I would do a classical effect system, then it would probably have to be written like that. Uh, so map now takes a second parameter, e, 
and it takes a function that maps A to B, and uh, it, it, this function could have this unknown effect E, and then the effect is an effect of the map as well. And that's a problem, because it's a more complicated signature. And you could say, well, it's actually not so bad, because, well, it's just map. But in fact, if you think about it, then any function that takes a function or an object as a parameter would have to be like that. Because any object you pass, well, when you invoke its methods, it could, need, it, it could have side effects, and these side effects would then be side effects of the map. So what you would get is an explosion of effect uh, parameters everywhere. And that's why nobody has done it. Actually, interestingly enough, you could do this in Java. Java has effect, uh, effect uh, uh, type variables that can range over effects. So you could do this in Java, but nobody's ever done it in, in, in serious code base. So it's just too complicated. So, okay, so that's the, co the core problem of effect polymorphism. We want to have a single version of map that works for all effects, and to do so is just too cumbersome. So if we switch to capabilities, then this is the type of map. Well, that's exactly the same type that we started with. So how, how can that be? Uh, well, it, the trick is that now the type of functions A, double arrow, B, is the type of possibly impure functions, and these impure functions can capture any capability as a free variable. So remember a function, we call that a closure. Why do we call it a closure? Because it can close over variables that it sees when we define it. So when we define a function, it can see a capability in its environment and says, okay, I take that. You, uh, dear map function, you don't need to pass it to me, I have it already. So I have the capability already, so I can perform whatever. Map doesn't need to be concerned with that. And that's the beauty of it. So then, of course, we want another function to say, well, let's say we have a parallel map that says apply this, this thing in parallel to a big vector, and then the function should not have a side effect, because that would, of course, be an, an, an unknown order uh, in which the side effects would be performed. So what we have is now a second type, a single arrow, A, a to B for pure functions. Um, you could say, uh, I, I, I like to say, well, uh, we have incredible foresight in Scala. Uh, we reserved the single arrow for pure functions for 20 years in Scala's existence because we know that it would come and uh, languages like Haskell or F Sharp or, or Camel all use single arrow for pure functions. So here, finally, we have arrived. Okay, good. So, um, but there's a catch. Um, uh, and what is the catch? Uh, so it, it can't be as simple as that, otherwise it wouldn't have been done already. So the catch is that can throw is, if you look at, well, how, how do we get a can throw capability in the first place? Well, the can throw capability would have to be generated by a try that catches the exception. So it says, well, if I catch the exception and handle it, then you can throw it, right? So the code inside the try can throw it. So. Uh, but the catch now is that that capability has a limited lifetime. When the try exits, the capability can no longer be used. So here we have something that uh, uh, would work. So what the capability translation would be, it would be this one here. So we say the, the function f that throws, it, it takes this can throw capability, and here at the map we pass a new can throw capability, and we have a right to do so because we catch it. Okay. But if we change this program slightly, then things go wrong. So what I do here is I have the same program, but now I map the function f over an iterator over the list excess. So lazily evaluate it. And if it's an iterator, then I can write next after the try. And then things go wrong because the try has exited. And at the time when I call next, the function, the, the function f would be invoked. Uh, with the, with the next value of the iterator, and there would be no try to catch it. So the question is, how can we rule out this program statically? And the core idea is we need to track in a type what are sort of the inherent capabilities it has, it hangs on to, that are not passed through, through the operations of the type from the outside. If I say, I, you need to give me a capability, I do something, that's okay. But if I say, I have it already, you don't need to do anything, like the thing we, we, we pass to map, that we need to track in a type. And the uh, idea to do so, so the proposed syntax is, uh, we write essentially a bunch of capabilities, C1 to Cn, uh, which you call a capture set in front of a type. 
And what then is a capability? Well, a capability is essentially just a reference to typically a parameter, can also be a local variable. Uh, and uh, the parameter and local variable is made into a capability because it has a non-empty capture set. So we say not every variable can, can be a capability, but only uh, a variable that itself captures something else. So that then you say, well, there must be some end to this, so there must be some root where all the captures come from, and indeed there is. Uh, so there's a root capability, which we call star, from which ultimately all others are derived. So what this is, is uh, interestingly enough, I think it's a type systematic description of the object capability model, which is actually well known in programming, mostly in security people, uh, in security settings, um, uh, but uh, so far has been dynamically typed only. So what we have is a uh, simple calculus. Uh, it's actually simple. Most <laughs> that, the, the fact that it fits on a single line is quite, a, quite an accomplishment for this. Uh, so and the fact that I can sort of present it on the slide. Uh, we have a, a capture checker prototype for a slightly larger uh, language subset, and the subset gets bigger and bigger. I think we, we have now most of Scala, so I'm currently trying to actually run the capture checker over the compiler itself, uh, and when that's achieved, that will be a big milestone. And uh, the, the big question is, uh, can we scale it up? And I think so far the initial uh, settings are, uh, are uh, quite promising. Um, so that's essentially the structure of this Caprese project. There are four things, uh, the core, which is the foundations and capture checking, then particular effect domains, memory safety and concurrency is the most important one. Then we all want to put this into Scala, so we have to do uh, a language in integration libraries and we have to worry about um, migration of existing code bases. And then we have applications, um, which are uh, in various domains. Security is important. High performance computing is important. So uh, it's, uh, uh, distributed systems uh, and also formal methods. So if successful, this work would solve several long-standing problems in programming, uh, among them effect polymorphism, I mentioned that. Uh, mixing synchronous and asynchronous code has, has, has very interesting uh, uh, ramifications because that's essentially uh, this what color is your function problem is essentially also an effect polymorphism problem that you say you want to be uh, have, a, have, a, have, have versions that work for synchronous as well as asynchronous code. Um, combining manual allocation and automatic GC and fearless concurrency. And I think it will lead to <coughs> exciting new ways to model functional and imperative programming, not as opposites, but as two ends of a spectrum. And I think that's the core of what Scala is really about. I'm out of time, so thank you for, for staying with me. And uh, I think we have a pause now, right? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. If you have questions, sit in the pause. <laughs>